Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dan Batista, the Executive Director of the Institute for Citizen-Centered Service. Thank you for joining us today for our web webinar with uh, guest speakers, Sumer Sayani and Guy Gordon of Pathos AI. The ICCS is really excited to be working with Pathos AI to develop greater insights into citizens' experiences with public sector services across Canada. And, <clears throat> excuse me. In a minute, my colleague Michal Jong, uh, the ICCS Manager of Research and Analytics, will introduce our guest speakers and set the stage for their presentation on this innovative work to measure citizens' emotional engagement with government services. Before I turn it over to Mihal, please note that we are recording this webinar and it will be available on our YouTube channel, Citizen First, in the next few days. You can also visit our website at citizenfirst.ca for more information about our services and other upcoming webinars and learning events. As a Teams live event webinar, you'll be able to submit your questions by using the Q&A function, which is located up top in the text boxes with the question mark. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation. We will set aside about 10 to 15 minutes or so at the end of the presentation to attempt to answer as many of your questions as possible. And now it's my pleasure to call on Michal to introduce our special guests. So over to you, Michal. Thank you, Dan, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm the ICCS Research Manager, and it is my real pleasure to introduce the two presenters for today's webinar, Sumer Sayani and Guy Gordon. Uh, but before I do, let me just very quickly echo what Dan had just said and add that this collaboration between the ICCS and Pathos AI marks a significant leap forward when it comes to expanding the depth of analysis and increasing the scope and consequently the value of actionable insights for public sector service providers. The pilot project focuses on analyzing open-ended responses from our recent citizen, Citizens First studies and the approaches that you will see form a natural extension of that research, taking to the next level what we can do with the data we collect. And so I look forward to engaging with our current and future clients and partners on how this can work for them. If you have questions or any kind of feedback following this webinar, I invite you to contact us via our Citizen First .ca website. So now let me introduce the two presenters. Sumer Sayani is the founder of Pathos AI and has worked at senior executive levels in Fortune 500 companies and global conglomerates. He has traveled to more than 40 countries across five continents for work. After PricewaterhouseCoopers in 1999, Sumer joined a Swedish conglomerate and carried several operational reviews there. He then joined Nielsen in 2002 in their then headquarters in the Netherlands. Uh, he went on to do CFO, strategy, client consulting, general management, and commercial sales leadership roles at Nielsen for over 17 years across three continents. His most recent role with Nielsen was leading a New York-based global think tank. There, he built and managed strategic relationships with senior leaders from world's largest tech and consumer-focused companies. In that role, he also led a global big data collaborative project that aimed to answer big challenges related to world's future. Sumer is a consummate thought leader, speaker, and moderator, and is currently focusing on solving complex growth problems uh, using AI. Guy Gordon is the Chief Government Advisor at Pathos AI and has held a series of senior executive positions in government, leading and directing service and digital innovation efforts at a departmental and enterprise levels. Guy is the former Executive Director of Innovation and Service Delivery for Government of Manitoba, where he led critical digital service transformation efforts, including digital ID, and creation of the government's robotic process automation center of excellence. Last year, Guy left the government of Manitoba to act as advisor and chief government officer of Pathos AI and Pigeon Line. He is also currently providing digital consulting services for the Yukon government and Sport Yukon. Guy has been an active leader in Canada's service delivery community for over 20 years, serving in numerous numerous leadership roles, which also includes serving in the past as the executive director of the ICCS. And now, without any further delay, let me hand it over to Sumer to lead today's webinar. Sumer, over to you. Hey, thanks, Michal. Uh, thanks, Dan. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Sumer. Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to make sure that all of you um, and your friends and your colleagues are doing well during these tough times. And I pray that you continue to do well and we get out of it, uh, you know, much better than where we, I know how we entered. 
I also want to take the chance to thank all the folks who are joining us from the government sector um, uh, from around the world, wherever you are. And thank you guys really for your effort and your hard work for keeping things going, um, you know, in this very, very un, uh, unplanned and unforeseen situations. And the way you guys have been able to get what you, you know, what you do every day and for us, for the citizens is, is just simply awesome. Um, for me, the journey and this moment is pretty interesting to to sit here and and you know talk with you know together with Dan and Mihal and and Guy, you know through the ICCS platform. I think for me the journey really started a few few years back, right? And I I want to take you through that a little bit because I think it's it's interesting. About nine years ago, I was in Dubai with the company Nielsen, um, and I was uh, tasked with setting up um, and leading a the our government sector research practice across 14 markets. And the way I started was to starting talking to people who were, you know, from the sector in the region where I was in, you know, around the region. And uh, and I wanted to ask them, you know, what are you doing? What is working? What are your challenges? What do you think is the, you know, is the best place to, 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 um, to learn, to learn from? And by and large, and I also spoke to our colleagues who are doing something similar in Australia and New Zealand and other places uh, from in from Nielsen. And by and large, the response was we started our journey based on this organization called ICCS and, and looking at the Canadian government. And that came up a lot. And I was obviously intrigued. I was like, OK, you know, this is very, very interesting that people in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Qatar and all those places are talking about an organization out of Canada. So I, I obviously wanted to know more. And that's really the, the first relationship started with ICCS. And, and I remember Guy was the person I spoke to first um, and Vihal was there. And, and, you know, I ended up actually hiring uh, somebody from ICCS. And, and Guy will tell you that, you know, there's one thing that he always hold it against me. Um, um, and great guy, you know, uh, uh, you know, still with us and uh, runs his own AI company. Um, so. But then when I, as I started to work in that sector, um, what I also learned and heard that, yes, we learn a lot from ICCS, but we are now ahead of the curve. You know, all those governments and all those locations saying, you know what, with digital transformation, with this innovation, trying out new things, we are ahead of the curve now. And, you know, we are building new things. And so over the years, talking to keep, keep keeping in touch with ICCS and the team there and now with Dan, I feel proud because I think what we are doing now and what we are done and what Dan and the team and you know Mihal and everybody are trying to do together with the board is I think is definitely getting ICCS ahead of the curve. Um, I think it's, it's it's great to have done what we have done, tested this pilot uh, using a very innovative way of measuring citizen uh, experience, and I'm I'm really happy to be here talking about that. So, just with that little bit of background. Um, let's get to the topic, which is I'm sure you're interested to know, are Canadians really in emotionally engaged with the government? But before I, I kind of tell you the answer to that question, um, let me just take a few steps, right? And, and try to build up to it, uh, keeps excitement going a little bit as well. I'm sure when you first heard this, this, this topic from coming from ICCS, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing your questions would be so what, what does it mean, right? Um, why are we measuring emotional engagement? Why are we measuring it now? What's what's changed? What's happening that, that we are measuring it now? And ultimately, obviously, as, as we would all do, uh, when we are asked to spend our time and our focus uh, from, you know, from all the things that we have to do, why should I care about it? Uh, what, why is it important? And to be honest, those are the questions that I asked myself uh, after spending all those years in market research and doing, you know, doing the way we do things. Is that are we truly, um, are we truly understanding the, you know, the, the citizens and their experience, right? What are the ways in which the technology evolution is allowing us to to go to the next to the next level? Um, and this was kind of propagated by my last role that Mihal talked about, where I, when I sat down with an advisory board of, of global leaders from top companies for you know tech and, and otherwise consumer focused companies, they are saying the same thing that, hey, you know what? What's next? How do we get closer? How do we understand the, the person, the human, the behind 
behind the data, right? And are we getting actionable information? So that was the really the motivation. Those are the questions that I asked to myself when when I founded, uh, um, you know, Pathos about a year and a half ago. Uh, um, you know, being here in Canada, and uh, and I think a lot of that background with ICCS and others kind of played a part. So all of you, uh, you know, guys have have looked at, have worked at, or been part of, or or have, you know, have experienced something called human-centered design, right? So you would have looked at things like, hey, you know what, assess financial viability. You would have looked at technical operational feasibility, and very importantly, you would have looked at desirability, right? Uh, what do humans desire? What do people desire? Our target audience. I'm sure all of you would have, you know looked at and have done a lot of customer journey mapping, right? Where again, your goal is to understand who is the citizen? Who are we serving, right? What are their needs? Um, how would they like to prefer to get the service? Where are we doing well? Where are we kind of not doing so well so that we can do better, right? You would have obviously looked at number of different ways and means to look at, you know, measure experience, um, understand what are the best uh, models that uh, that help you understand customer experience. Um, you know, one that I find to be very, very interesting is, um, and you know, Guy will tell you maybe a little bit about it as well from his experience, um, where a lot of the conversions is happening is on success, measuring success. Do people, do our customers, citizens, were able to get what they were looking for? How much effort they had to put, right? That's where the problem happens. If they have to put a too much effort, a little bit too much effort, right? Uh, and what have been their emotions? during uh, that experience. So, I mean, you know, when you talk, when you think of all these different factors, what is common across all of these is that you're looking at some data, right? Data about citizen, data about people, right? Trying to understand what they really want, who they really are, right? Identify the gaps in, in your delivery um, to, to those people. And then, if, you know, eventually, I, I don't prioritize, identify, what makes more sense? You spend tens of thousands of dollars based on that knowledge, right? And um, and let me say this, uh, my you know, and something I would say a bit uh, um, challenging as well to the to the norm is that it is our belief that the the data about people, about citizens, the way it has been collected to date, uh, and on which you've made decisions. Um, is not really the real true understanding of citizens, um, you know, what they really, really want and who they really are and what they really, what really matters to them. And I'll tell you why, um, you know, as we go along. Now, as you would know that when a customer or citizen is, is, is interacting with you or th with the services, it's the moments, right? The, it's the is the interactions. There are points in an interaction in that experience where you're doing great, or you know, it's, it's falling apart a little bit, right? From a customer's perspective. So what we believe, truly believe, is that the experience depends on those interaction moments that are important to the citizens, right? And how do you understand what is important to citizens? What, which part of the, which interaction? which part of the interaction and what about that interaction that is important to the citizen, right? And overwhelming research. I spent months talking to a lot of people, experts like Guy, like Dan, um, you know, neuroscience leaders and cognitive behavior leaders and, and uh, doing a lot of reading. And it turns out that that the basic determinant of this importance of that moment is the emotions that are being expressed by citizens during those moments, during those interactions. That emotion, emotional inflection point in that moment is really where the, the, the juice is, is where the interest is. Now, because of that, your goal is to get to emotional engagement. What does that, what does that mean? Emotions, as you would know, sometimes are conscious, some, you know, are, you know, consciously expressed um, or openly expressed. Uh, but they're driven a lot of times by subconscious motivators, right? They are under the surface, so they're hard to to read. But it, they drive emotional engagement, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how we understand emotional engagement based on a lot of academic uh, theories. But basically, 
emotional engagement is based on starting point is an emotional inflection inflection point in the moment. And then finally, there's a research also suggests overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly that even in the government sector that uh, emotional engagement or engagement drives trust in the government um, as well as the future behavior, uh, if you, uh, the practices or um, you know the decisions that citizens make about uh, which affects you know the government. And there is some thought leadership that we will be putting out there uh, on this topic very soon as well. So you can read that. So the gap is in the traditional methods um, is that you know that does not measure emotions. Um, you cannot ask people on cue there about their emotion. As I said, it's under the surface. So it's hard to to if not impossible to for a person to on cue um, being you know kind of express uh, in a cohesive right in a way what their emotion was at a certain point in time about a certain thing. Even if you get to it, if you believe you could, um, is also very difficult to then understand in that moment what was the driver for that emotion. Um, we don't really measure interactions. We measure uh, you know after the fact uh, by asking. So so that's um, you know that's obviously you you're not really in the moment uh, when uh, the interaction is happening. Uh, it's a bit lagged, so it, it's not quick enough. It's not fast enough. And it's it focuses more on 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 you know giving metrics uh, with little focus on specific um, actionability, um, and then finally it's not using this massive big data um, that is being generated as is without any effort, right, and without any extra cost. So it it goes on uh, you know creating new data rather than trying to leverage what already exists. So. Looking at all this, we said, you know what? There's, there's got to be a better way. There is technology available. There are ways in which we need to do this better. So, our motto, basically, that Pathos AI wanted to start with and wanted to stick to and wanted to reinforce is never asking an earth thing, right? Which basically means that we, we, we rely on data that is not necessarily, uh, it could, but not necessarily. Uh, generated by uh, asking people specifically, but it could actually go and look at um, primary data, uh, customer generated data, right? So we built, and I'll tell you a bit more about those, uh, some AI models together with knowledge and experience from sector, like, you know, the guy being in the part of the team and and uh, and so and so have you. We were able to create, uh, you know, a platform, a SaaS based tool solution that basically identify in the moment what matters most to citizens in an interaction, uh, measure the real uh, outcome of those interactions, and then most importantly use look at the customer generated data. And then as a result of doing that, um, we are able to to unearth uh, the human stories because those matter. The human behind the experience matter because that's what's going to tell you exactly which moments are important, which which areas within that experience are critical to your success. How does it work? First of all, we believe that every interaction is important and needs to be needs to be understood. And um, the way we work is typically is is sourced from a number of different academic uh, frameworks and models, but just a simple one that I can maybe talk about is the Lazarus theory of emotions. Um, there are many, uh, but the simple way to explain is through that. So imagine, you know, which which basically says that there is an event, uh, a, a stimulus, if you may, which creates uh, humans to go through an analysis process, you know, the mental analysis process, and then that results in in them reacting uh, with a certain emotion. So keep a very simple example. You're camping out there with your family, um, and you know um, so that you know a bear walks through the the camping site. That becomes the the event, the stimulus. Your mental process that you're going to analyze is that oh my god, I'm I'm done for. Um, this bear is going to hurt me, my family, and your emotional reaction is fear of flight, right? What we do is we try to flip that. We we, we flip that model and say okay, let's start with emotional uh, inflection points. Let's try to identify in a moment where there's an emotion that are being displayed. And it's not just 
a positive or a negative emotion, but we try to understand multitude of emotions because you know what? We are we are funny people, humans. We express different emotions in different situations. Fear is different from frustration, which is different from disgust, which is different from anger, right? So, so same goes for on our positive side. Not only that, it's also important to understand the intensity of the emotion being expressed because that gives value to that interaction. If I'm really angry versus I'm just a little bit annoyed, you know, there are two different moments, the two, two different uh, interactions. And obviously the one where I'm really, really angry with something that I've experienced, that takes more importance uh, from an actionability perspective, from a keep doing perspective, uh, staying the course perspective, obviously we look at, um, you know, the, the positive as well. So very quickly, how do we do it? We, we believe there are three ways, or at least we would like to measure uh, three ways in which humans express their, their emotions, what they're saying, uh, what citizens are saying, uh, how they are saying it, and their body posture, which is right now in, in final development stages and beta testing. Um, and let me just say that in, in body posture, we don't look at face, uh, facial recognition or facial coding. That's not part of our, of our model. We don't have the means to do that uh, in our model. We then look at, okay, fine, we've detected an emotion. We have identified that there is something interesting there, but then go to the next level and say, what is driving that, that, that emotion and how important is that driver, right, to the customer? And that this goes um, into, a, you know, identifying a, a number of different uh, possible drivers that, you know, again, with, with Guy being the very knowledgeable in this sector, we have identified what are the most important drivers um, to, to citizens when they talk about government service experience. But not only that, we also look at within those drivers, which ones have, are more important than others. And so we, the way we do the calculation is we give that value to what would likely be more important to, to, the, to the citizens. And then finally, we look at, okay, so what was happening? What was the context? What was the service? Um, what was the channel that was being used? Uh, what was the point in customer journey that potentially is of is of values of interest? Uh, because that's where we see recurring problems, right, or challenges, or or you know phenomenal phenomenal performance. And then finally, we present it in the in the within the ambit of uh, people product process because that would uh, you know enable better focus of investment and and resource planning and and decisions, right, where you need to focus. When you look at what citizens say, where do we get this data from, or where we where we could get this data from? Yeah, there are a number of different sources. Where we look at text data, a number of different platforms that organizations, different types of organizations use. When you talk about voice or tone, or how they are saying it, um, our tool is language and accent agnostic and looks at again different types of uh, potential uh, sources. And same goes for how they move. Now, very quickly, why? And that takes us to the setting it up for eventually what I'm going to show you, the outcome of the emotional engagement of Canadians. And I'm, I'm going to show it to you in, in the first two buckets here. So how engaged they are, right? Um, you know, what's, what's happening there in terms of the engagement. And then I'm also going to show you a little bit what, where the focus needs to be to improve the engagement. Right, um, so though I just wanted to show you that that that's how we organize the, the output so that it's easily consumable to you measure performance in one side and then you identify actions with the other. Why is it important? Um, I, I'll I'll say here and and you know I have uh, my colleague Guy as well um, on the call, so you know um, he might want to jump in into this as well. But really, the focus is that. You, you gotta be both strategic and tactical. Um, you know, in 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 what how you could use this information. So we basically would like to organize this benefits into foundational, insightful, and the utility of them. Moment of truth. So what are those key moments? What are the the point in in their journey that are very very important that needs focus? We talk about emotional duality, right? Um, pe people might be, it could be a progression of emotion. So you call one time, you don't get your solution, you're told to go in person, uh, you're already ticked off, 
And then, you know, within when you go in person, um, it doesn't work after a certain point in time. It closes, uh, you know, even before your office closes. So, you, you, you know, you are you have to take time off. And then when you go there, you are, um, you know, you have to wait in line. So you are pretty ticked off. But when you get to the service counter, it was excellent, right? The, the, the service was great. The person was awesome, knowledgeable. You get it done in 30 seconds. Awesome. So there is a progression of negative emotion, uh, energy, and the experience wasn't that great. But then it turned to positive because eventually, uh, you know, you got what you're looking for. So, you know, you need to be able to understand um, exactly where to focus um, and what to keep doing well. I talked about uh, the motivations, uh, said and unsaid, in implicit and explicit, which basically leads us to the driver part of it. So what is driving it? Um, and you need to look at it by touch point, channel, product, service. Eventually, you, you want to be able to predict the outcomes, right? So if a certain profile of a citizen looking for a certain type of service, looking for a certain ch through a certain channel, you got to be able to know what they're looking for and what would delight or not so much the result, not so much uh, positive experience. And if once you switch to real time and, and real life measurement, which is we hope that you eventually would, um, because that's where the real power comes in, is that then you would be able to even intervene before um, the, the person that interaction ends so that you can actually make it, you know, intervene and make it better before it ends. Um, and then as I link to it, obviously, is what, is what, I, what I just said in time, uh, in the moment, uh, actionability. In terms of utility, we, we look at, you know, where you need to focus. So you don't invest everywhere. You invest and you, uh, you know, allocate scarce time and resources onto where, where you need to, where you must. Um, it identifies specific, could it could identify even specific aspects of the service that requires uh, improvement. And then eventually, obviously, what it also does, which I love about the fact what ICCS does um, is this whole aspect of the, you know, the knowledge, you know, sharing, right? So, so what have you learned? How can we make it, uh, you know, accessible to others, right? So that everybody gets better. I, and I love that aspect of ICCS. And that's something, the first thing that caught my eye, eye about um, ICCS. It's, it's Guy here, if you can hear me. Yes. Okay, so welcome everybody. This might be a good point for me to kind of just uh, touch base, and because I think this is a very, very critical point, and it's it's a good um, segue to my experience being in this space for the last number of years, and, and certainly my experience with the ICCS and all of the, the members of the service delivery community. So this um, this point that we're at now, I would summarize by saying that um, in 2020, we're now being given an opportunity to have a richer set of diagnostic tools by which we can do four things. Um, and, then, and one of them is to have data to allow us to make tactical day-to-day -day, um, decisions or in the moment decisions about how we may want to uh, change the, the the way in which we deliver service for individuals. Secondly, as managers, we are definitely very interested in thinking about operational considerations. If, if we're if we're operating a Service Canada or Service BC office, whether that's in um, um, Trail BC or we're we're in a small community in, in Newfoundland or or or, or, or regional office and you know on the outskirts of GTA um, we really want to understand operations at our local level um, and we've all gotten better at those things right there's no doubt about it we've gotten better um, but now we're, we're I know managers are looking for better data better insights and and, a, and and the emotional component of the customer experience journey is something that hasn't been one of our focus areas but increasingly, the literature and the research and the, the tools that are now available allow us to do that. Um, a third element, which those of us who are involved lately in digital and in digital transformation, of which COVID has absolutely driven to the top of the agenda, has been, as you said earlier, the human-centered design element. And that is absolutely 
as we know, those of us who have done work in, in nudge and in behavioral insight is at its core understanding how people react, how the psychology of humans is not that of the pure economic actor, but it's a psychological actor. And our ability now to understand how people react to prompts and nudges and experiences, not only in terms of the transaction, but also the impact on relationships and the outcomes and the effectiveness of our service and therefore the effectiveness of our design is huge. So for example, I'm now working on two implementations that cost a lot of money. But if it's not designed for the right audience in the right way, and we leave 25 to 30% of the potential users abandoning the application, never coming back to the program, phoning only to be put in a long line, only to call into the office of your MP or MLA to say, what's the problem? I can't get through. Your system doesn't work. Then, then we have failed. And we know that. And that's why we're making tremendous efforts. And then lastly, I would say, as an organization, our strategy to build our own capabilities, to make decisions about how to balance uh, the right set of challenges and to guide us through this digital transformation is huge. The last thing I'll say before I turn it back to you is um, a very interesting insight that I picked up from a number of leading writers of late who've been talking about the emotional vulnerability of Canadians. Never, ever, ever have so many of us been put in a position of emotional strain. And how are we adapting to that reality. And I would hazard to guess that 98% of our operations have not in any measurable way been able to understand and adjust their service. Now, I'm not saying that people aren't intuitively on this and haven't made efforts, but my I could be wrong. Maybe 80, maybe it's only that maybe 80% have it. Maybe one in five organizations is plugged into this. But it just gives you an illustration of why noting and understanding the emotional engagement has an impact. And we've come a hell of a long way from simply asking Canadians once every two years what their service experience is to now being in an understanding to almost understand this in real time. And that's what attracted me to this work and why I'm so excited. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Samir. Thanks, Guy. Appreciate that. So before I uh, jump onto and and you know, right up ahead is is showing you the results of of the um, of the work. Uh, but just before I do that, let me just show you a quick, uh, a very thirty second video of what we were able to get as a as an example, one example of from this work. Right, um, the video is silent. All right, so just to show you an example of um, there, obviously there are many stories that we can pull out of the work that we have done, but just wanted to show you one. All right, with this, um, I will uh, flip switch my screen so you might see me doing that to the to a um, to our uh, dashboard. Now, this is the the outcome of the the pilot that uh, Dan and Michal refer to 
And as you, as I mentioned to you, that we have arranged it into a couple of buckets, uh, engage and prompt. And the work was done based on the CF7 and CF8 uh, data. And uh, the outcome is that Canadians are negatively engaged overall with the government and government service at the moment. Uh, well, of the of the surveys that were done earlier based on that. Now, just to give you a context, this basically means we, we measure the engagement from plus one to minus one. Um, so in our, you know, kind of benchmarking category, this turns out to be an overall level uh, when we combine CF7 and CF8, a somewhat engaged uh, Canadians, but obviously there are variations. If you look at different locations, um, which we're not showing right now, but if you want to know about your own location, uh, you can certainly reach out to, to ICCS Dan and Michal, and they'll probably be happy to share that with you. But at an overall level, um, this is what the situation is. Somewhat engaged, towards negative. Now, let's start to go a little bit deeper into what's happening, right? Where are the, the you know, the bits of and pieces of of um, insights that could be used to to identify areas where we need to maybe take some action. So when we break this down between product, uh, people and process, it turns out that people and process at an overall level across both CF7 and CF8, uh, it's the process that's really bringing things down. And if you look at the engagement score of for the process, it's fairly low. Right, it's pretty much getting towards not engaged. People is not too far behind. And I'll explain a little bit more what what makes up the you know people process and and product. Product on the other hand is doing a little better, uh, quite better actually, because there is a positive emotional engagement when we talk about uh, the product. So that's that's pretty good. That being said, um, there are variations between locations, uh, as we saw. Uh, and between cycles uh, of the of the work. So uh, when you see that, you will you will be able to compare it. Uh, you know what's happening in your own jurisdiction. When we look at the emotions, the net emotion score across Canada Canada between CF7 and CF8 is minus 0.3, which is yeah going towards a little bit of a higher in negative intensity, uh, net negative intensity emotions with the government service. And as you can see here, when we look at uh, the expression of anger um, at their experience, it's pretty high. Um, and again, as I said, if once you once you once you go into deeper, you will be able to break this down into different um, ways, and you know that are explained here at the top, uh, that you can break these things down in by different buckets, so that really drill down and understand what's going on. Before I go any further, let me just quickly give you a snapshot of um, what's happening with the services. So when I come when we combine everything and in, in the case of service, we looked at a, a sample of service data, right? So how are, is emotional engagement going on with the service? And if you can see on a sample data, uh, this is not the full CF7 CF8 data, but sample data, we see that the traffic management and driving license testing and renewal is fairly low. Um, in terms of their emotional engagements, and you can grill down by all the different services, um, and there are more. Obviously, there are a number of different services that are being tested um, in the survey. So that view I found to be also fairly interesting to see where are we, what what's really the the service which is driving um, where the the emotional engagement is is fairly low. So let's try to understand the drivers. Right? What is driving this? So if I go down into the drivers and I start to break it down, the drivers between people, process, and product, when it comes to process, there is a huge problem and the biggest weightage and the biggest score that we're seeing is in waiting time. So waiting time is the biggest driver of negative emotional engagement in when it comes to the process, followed by timeliness. So between the two of them, um, they're really bringing things down quite a bit. Everything else is kind of, you know, when you talk about 
positivity that they are able to you know get you know do go on get on with their lives for example that's what positivity means that as a as you know service experience is not taking anything away from their you know doing what they want to do in their lives right so and that's an important factor for us uh, to measure uh, from an experience perspective so that's there uh, channel satisfaction is there uh, sorry uh, convenience of the process fairly important but by far timeliness and waiting time is killing it at the moment. When we look at people, the two most important, I would say even third one is, you know, the care that is shown by um, the people who they talk to on the phone or in person. Um, that's a bit of a challenge at an overall level. The communication is a challenge and and that's you know that basically is driven by the number of touch points um, that that um, that uh, that are coming through, right? That people have to connect with to be able to get eventually what they're looking for, the information or solution or or anything that that of that sort. So communication is turning out to be a fairly important, and you will see wh why I'm saying what I'm saying and where I'm getting that information. And then finally, the knowledge. So they talk to somebody, they and the person does not really is able to answer their questions and the, he refers or she refers it to somebody else and and that something that they feel that they are really not able to um get the answers straight away or or complete answers or you know correct answers for that matter let's go further and say okay which channel is the is doing well and which channel is bringing things down so it turns out that telephone and followed by online is on something that is really a problem where the engagement is fairly low. And uh, if you break that down between people, product and, and, and uh, process, the telephone bit is fairly consistent. You will find that people who, you know, even when the people issue, when they're talking to somebody on the phone, the waiting time, the speed, uh, the communication is fairly low. Even when it comes to the process side of things, you know, the telephone is where the, the biggest issue is. Um, interestingly, in the case of process, um, in person is also fairly high um, as a channel where you know the people are finding it uh, a little bit of a challenge that they have been made to wait um, quite a bit and they felt that it's driven by people not really sometimes you know giving them attention uh, and, and you know or caring about the fact that opening up new tickets or you know new windows to to give that service um, so that's you know what we call drill down and you can, as I said, you can drill down a number of different ways to understand what's driving it. And then finally, so let's identify the action. Where do I need to focus? I mean, it's a little bit clear uh, from when you look in, when you looked at the last chart, but here's something we are trying to say, okay, if you want to think about age group, these are the three top three age groups, which are where you really need to focus at an overall level. If you're looking at the income groups, this is the income groups which are which have the highest negative emotional engagement score. Same goes for gender, uh, same goes for occupation. So these are really the, the ones. And if you again, if you choose your own location, um, uh, you know, and you choose different dimensions, you'll be able to see all those, all these numbers um, refreshed and updated for that particular choice. What you see here is uh, what we call a tree map or a node ma ma map where you just keep on starting from one point. You go to the end node and see, OK, so where are my top three action points? So if I were to just click all the way down to see when I look at, you know, telephone, what is it that I really I really need to focus on? So within telephone, people is the is the biggest uh, is, is where you really need to focus on. Within people is the homemakers and males which have the highest score. Other and so and so forth, right? Part-time student full of part-time females. That's where you really need to focus. So next time when you're talking to somebody with this kind of demographic on the phone, you know, and you know the drivers that causes those challenges, you know to take care of those things. Otherwise, that's going to have a problem on your overall uh, engagement score. Now, if you remember, I talked about things being faster or one people to talk to, one person to talk to, you know, not multiple touch points. Where, where, where do we get that from? So what we also do is we measure uh, specific terms that people use when they talk about an experience. And we try to then un, or, you know, understand what is the most frequent thing that they're saying about that particular topic, 
right, about that particular driver, right, especially when you have interesting emotions being expressed. So as you can see here across the board, um, help is more, you know, that people are not really helpful. So it's from a care perspective. Things need to be much faster. That's where the timeliness comes in. People talked about being talked to one person, right? One contact, not multiple touch points. I want one window solution. I don't want to talk to 10 different people or 10 different places I need to get to to get to to be able to get what I'm looking for. And so that's really where we uh, kind of try to bring that together. Requesting that they're saying about that particular topic, right? About the particular driver, right? So, so that's um, that's really where um, I wanted to stop uh, for now, and um, and uh, you know, with the hope that um, as a result of you know this, what I presented, um, and certainly open for for questions, um, you know, I was I hope that I was able to answer these questions that you may have had at the beginning of the call. Mihal, great. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You. Sarah. Yes, that, that was wonderful. Thank you very much for the uh, the presentation. And I know there's you know so much uh, material and, and insight uh, to cover off in a short period of time. So we do have uh, a number of questions um, right before we get into them. I just want to again stress to uh, everyone that uh, we are very much in early days in terms of our partnership with Pathos AI with uh, Sumer and Guy and Michal and I are extremely excited about this work, right? It's it's innovative, uh, exciting work that really starts to sort of peel back some of the layers with regard to the work we've done, uh, you know, for example, Citizen First. Um, and, and I think a point you made right at the start, uh, Sumer, the, the ability to sort of repurpose uh, existing uh, data, uh, you know, in terms of citizen satisfaction is, is really key. So we're very excited about this work. So in in um, being mindful of time, let me just uh, jump into uh, to a few questions here because uh, we do uh, have uh, uh, some folks that have uh, written in. So thank you for those questions. So the, the first one is a bit lengthy, uh, Sumer. I'm going to try to summarize this and, and I think it has to do with the fact that um, you know as, as citizens consumers we often have sort of uh, you know uh, preconceived notions or, or emotions uh, going into certain transactions right or interactions especially with government now I don't want to pick on uh, my colleagues at uh, the Canada Revenue Agency but they always seem to be the ones that uh, folks flag so for example um, this uh, individual is asking about uh, taxes, right, and uh, and sort of making that experience uh, better, right, uh, and then the idea that you know in the future there might be less and less need to to interact directly with an agency uh, such as CRA. So the question is uh, specifically around you know emotions are going to be predetermined. Um, so how do we kind of uh, account for the fact that they're always going to be there in how we design? Uh, services, right? I think um, this individual is trying to drive at that distinction between the actual experience and the fact that there's already, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll put it this way, sort of baggage, uh, emotional baggage, if you will, uh, perhaps with past uh, interactions. So how would you account for that, I guess, Samir? It's a, it's, it's a great question, but probably a tough one uh, to answer uh, in, in a few sentences. Yeah, so, so, Great question. I agree. It's a great question and great thought process. So, so I, I feel that it means that the person is, you know, really grasping the concept that 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 uh, that I presented. So for us, a moment becomes interesting when we see, uh, uh, you know, an emotional inflection. Regardless of wherever your baseline emotion is, what we what we try to detect is from that baseline that you enter with, did it get better or worse? That particular interaction, did it cause that in an emotional inflection, right? Mm -hmm. In 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 what you're going through, and that becomes our point of discovery. That something happened, that that ticked right you either in a positive way or or in a negative way, and that's where we want to start our journey of investigation and and drilling down. If that makes sense. Okay, uh, that's great. It's, it's, it's guy here. If you guys can hear sure, me, go ahead, guy. One more piece on that. Um, you know, I think it's a very, it's a brilliant question, and 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 I, and I think it's a very interesting question because, in a way, um, uh, we're probably on the cusp of doing something we've never been able to do before, and that is to measure the baseline level of expectations and 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 and, and in essence, what 
what we're talking about is the perception of the organization and how transactions or relationship either improves or or diminishes that sort of um, mental perception and what impact that has as either an accelerator or a drag or an anchor on future interactions. So if you think about that in the context of a relationship one has of trust, of confidence, of positivity or negativity, that ability to look at this at a macro level or a micro level, we're only now for the first time ever going to be able to have an ability to track on that. When I was at the ICCS, I regularly got asked, how do we know if expectations are changing at the macro level or not? Are we measuring against uh, like how much of expectations change? One interesting side note example, and I won't pick up on the federal government because this is for industry in 2020 as a whole. People are regularly now expecting to wait two, three, four hours to get service for uh, an organization on the phone. They never expect to do that before, but in a COVID environment, for some reason, we're sort of putting up with it just because of it. Um, we never would have, uh, ministers offices would have been inundated, uh, governments would have fallen, but in a, in a COVID world, um, to sit there on the phone to wait two to three hours dealing with your phone company or an airline or trying to get anything like that is now regular. So it's interesting how expectations change, but, but mm -hmm. I think we're now able to measure it. So I'll just say that that, okay. that was a great question and I hope that was helpful. Great. Thank you, Guy. Um, again, being mindful of time here, I'll move right on to the next question. So a question comes in asking, are all services that uh, we looked at scoring negative? Is there anything above zero? And uh, and certainly it is striking to see those negative scores. But uh, again, Sumer, perhaps you, you could speak to that question. Yeah, the services that we um, that we selected and looked at, uh, took a sample of data to to measure, um, it, it was negative. Yeah, it, 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 it honestly, uh, I think when Michal and I looked at uh, the the results from from this uh, first round of work, we, we were somewhat uh, astonished as well. So it, it uh, there's certainly a lot there to uh, to to look at and and again uh, uh, consider as we move forward. And again, just just a reminder, folks, that uh, this is really innovative uh, work that we're doing here. Uh, and again, we are. You know, happy to work with uh, any organization or jurisdiction that uh, is is interested in exploring how how we can uh, bring this uh, to help provide you with uh, you know more insights. Uh, let me move on to uh, another question here, uh, and that is with regard to um, you know, can we share a real life use case from the beginning to end in terms of uh, how how this, your service was used to to solve or address an issue, right? And I, I think the with the uh, uh, the the question here really is about is like you talked earlier, Sumer, about the uh, the client journey, right? Um, so can we take this approach as well to sort of, you know, um, conduct the analysis from from end to end? Because again, a lot of our work is is very transactional based, right? It's that immediate experience. But can we look at this more holistically across an entire client journey? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's I would love I would love for her to do that. Um, we, we did not have that data right now for this pilot, but um, that's exactly where we where we want to go. Uh, okay. We want to be able to do that, obviously keeping in mind the necessary aspect of uh, data privacy and all that. But yeah, that's that's absolutely the direction we need to go. And we sure go. We want to go. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, um, I would, I would sorry, also, go ahead, guys. I would also bear in mind that um, Given the, the the last couple of years I spent working with the back end uh, internal services, I can think of an endless array of use cases from IT help desks to um, procurement consultation services to logistics to any one of those things that we do in government for each other that um, we regularly struggle to understand where was the breakdown in service and and why were people increasingly difficult or hostile to our attempts to build a strong working relationship and and this would be a perfect example of where one could deploy this type of assessment to figure out um you know where's the breakdown what's the trigger of the breakdown and what what particularly are the issues on the minds of the of the both in things that they say to us and in things they don't say to us so that notion of trust and confidence and how they perceive us 
um, um, and it, it would be incredibly helpful. And those are some use cases from my experience that I would speak to. Excellent. Thank you, Guy. Um, again, we've got a few more minutes left. So uh, another question here. Um, I've had, there's been actually a couple of questions and perhaps uh, Samaria can speak to uh, the ability to sort of customize or tailor uh, this type of um, analysis uh, to specific programs uh, and, and, and services. So uh, going kind of from the approach we've taken for this uh, pilot project, but right down to sort of a program or service level. Could, could you speak to that? So the beauty of this new way of measuring um, is that it's 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 agnostic, right? Uh, in in terms of its applicability, in terms of its usability, in terms of its um, deployment to different use case, you know, different situations. What it really hinges on, what it really depends on, and the pivot is all around the availability of data. So wherever there is that opportunity uh, that presents itself. Uh, yes, the, you know, we, we could go and answer a very specific um, question that we can look at that relates to measuring emotions and emotional engagement in terms of giving, and this is something Guy and I have talked about uh, quite a bit as well, that how do, you know, it would be interesting to find a very good use case that could connect it back to very specific decisions uh, mm -hmm. that the jurisdiction can take, right? Th think about uh, efficiency, think about uh, strategy, um, right? Service design specific things. It could be at that broad level. It could be a very specific level, even things like, hey, you know what? You know, what are the specific things of my website that that custom that citizens are having trouble with, right? Mm -hmm. So it could, it could go down to that level as well. Um, and, you know, would love to love to talk about that. Right, right. OK, thank you uh, for that, Sumer, which I, I think um, you know, uh, highlights a, a key point here, right? And it comes back to data and avail availability of, of data within organizations, right? I think this is, uh, you know, what struck, uh, you know, me and, and Michal is, uh, is just the potential uh, of working with Pathos uh, AI is that um, many organizations are, are right now going through kind of this data renaissance, right, and data strategies and whatnot. So it, it is, I think, uh, an incredible time and opportunity to to look at potential pilot work uh, and to explore, right? Because again, we're still very much, uh, I think, in early days of this. So for any uh, of the folks who are listening in today, again, we we encourage you to reach out to us. Um, and we can then have a, you know, a more sort of a customized uh, discussion with regard to uh, the challenges, the, the needs you may have and, and what data you may have available. So let me uh, try to get in a couple more questions here as we uh, come uh, pretty much to the end of the hour. Um, this one is uh, with, uh, with regard to the dashboard. Um, so uh, the dashboard's impressive, connects a lot of the dots, uh, but at the end of the day, um, the issue, I guess, and 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 this one, um, you know, talks about uh, the fact that you know, you, you, you going to a dentist can 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 be a pleasant experience, but you're still going to a dentist. Um, so I guess uh, what they're asking is, does it change ex expectations about the outcome or the final product? Again, I think this is similar to that question I asked uh, right at the beginning about you know what people bring into um, you know that that uh, interaction or that that experience. Um, you know, he heading into it. So I, I don't know how you want to tackle that one, Samara. I don't know how you feel about dentists, but uh, your thoughts on, again, so that notion of uh, preconceived uh, emotions heading into uh, an interaction. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's Guy again. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me sure. start with that one. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's a really, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question, but, but you know, I, the experience of going to see a dentist in 2020 is very different than it was in 1980 or 1970. Mm -hmm. Just like dealing with government is very different and it's becoming increasingly different. And and if you think about what's on the minds of dentists and, and, and how they how they operate, that experience is incredibly important for them. Um, and it's incredibly important for government. So the fact that we need to collect taxes, we have to impose regulatory, we have to say no. Uh, we have to uh, lead people through incredibly complex, challenging regulatory uh, service experiences. 
we have to make decisions that impact people's lives, whether you're a police officer or an immigration consultant. We have all of these things that we need to do, but the way to understand where we can make the experience less painful is clearly in front of us. And lots of organizations are taking the time and the effort to be able to figure out how to make that service. Nonetheless, um, I'm glad I went to the dentist. I'm glad I had to pay my taxes eventually. We all have our responsibilities, but I think the dentist analogy is a really good one because it speaks to um, what's necessary and what doesn't have to be necessary. So that would be my take and the right. insights you get in being okay. able to even be open to the idea that we could change our experience and we don't have to make it a 1970s experience. So mm -hmm. I'll just say one more time. 7,055 paper forms in Manitoba in 2020. I don't have to say anymore. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Guy. Um, we are pretty much at the end of the hour. I wanted to uh, to give Samira uh, the opportunity for any uh, last words uh, before we wrap things up. Uh, no, I just wanted to thank you, Dan and Michal, and for your vision and uh, to the whole team at ICCS for you know, getting ahead of the curve and I'm looking, you know, at this something to, to do something very innovative and unique. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Samir and Guy and, uh, and and the work that we're doing with Pathos AI. Again, we're very excited. Um, and for all of you uh, who uh, joined us today, uh, please uh, reach out to us uh, and uh, let's talk about how we can work with you folks. We've got our contact information on screen now. So thank you once again, all of you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.